Harvard Psychology and Pop Culture had a baby, they'd call it Shrink Tank. Shrink Tank. A new paper reveals more intelligent people are quicker to learn and unlearn. 90% chance that there's some like, weird animal out there. Yeah. Alan Stern's been doing this forever. And far more extreme. From Nashville and Charlotte, this is the Shrink Tank Podcast. Welcome, everybody, to a live recording of the Shrink Tank Podcast at the 2018 Heroes Con in downtown Charlotte. I'm Dave Verhagen. I'm a psychologist, an author, and a bad magician true. And normally I'm coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee, but I return to my old stomping grounds here in Charlotte to be here live with you guys and the rest of our panel. So let's meet our panel. First, she's a psychologist, a fan of The Bachelor or Bachelorette, and a real life girl in Com- or Heroes Con, I said that last time too, <laughs> who she has survived cancer, an apartment fire, an earthquake, and a broken engagement. Let's hear it for the most recent inductee to the Country Music Hall of Fame, Dr. Emma Kate Wright, everybody. Howdy. And he's a psychologist, a national expert on Asperger's, the co-author of the popular Max Gamer graphic novel, and Paul Manafort's former cellmate. Please give a heartfelt Heroes Con welcome to Dr. Frank Gaskell. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And he's a licensed professional counselor, an expert in substance abuse treatment, and the author of several book chapters. He's also our certified Asian, and winner of RuPaul's Drag Race, there's the man himself, Jonathan Hederley. We have a big topic today. We're gonna talk about the effects of violence in media, especially video games, TV, and movies. And since we're talking about violence, it's only fitting that we ask about your own personal history of violence first to kick it off. So Emma Kate, have you ever been in a fight? So for those who don't know, I've actually been to jail. (laughs) And no, I'm an extremely nonviolent person. Um, I I I have an older brother Frank is kind of like that to me You've too. You punched me in the face it's like true. five I, times. I have punched him in the face. Um, no, but I do. I, I have an older brother, and I have this habit of slamming things. Like, and it's not intentional. I swear to God, but in his mind, it is very intentional to piss him off. And I closed our side door to our house really hard when I was in high school, and he came flying out, started like cussing at me, yelling at me, and then I punched him in the face. <laughs> and that's the only fight I've ever been in. And that was my story. And I found $20. <laughs> and you found $20. Mm-hmm. That. Frank. Uh, I was on the receiving end of a great many fights. Um, I never was able to swing or do anything except fall down and get choked out. So And cry. Yeah, and I would cry a lot. And wet yourself. And wet myself. Okay. Yeah. Jonathan? Well, I think I avoided a lot of fights growing up because I was Asian and people assumed I knew martial arts. Like I, I seriously, if I would strike a pose, larger kids would actually show ambivalence uh, about that. My, my brother and I, we got in a fight. I'm the youngest of four. We're both Korean, we're both adopted. And one time we were just playfully sparring, pretending like we knew martial arts, because we didn't. And then I think I kicked him a little hard and he got mad, so he kicked me hard and I hit him in the face and he got really mad and I could just see like with his narrow red eyes that he was mad so I ran away from him and I ran up to the top of the stairs and then right then and there I just didn't have a plan so I just turned around jumped down from the top of the stairs and kicked him in the face and broke his (laughs) nose split it wide open pool of blood and my parents were divorced so my dad came and picked him up the next morning, and we didn't talk for six months. <laughs> and, nice then, one. and this wasn't a fight, but I did also have a moment of aggression one time in middle school when my mom and I were getting in a fight, um, and she, she tried to kind of like restrain me, and I got loose, and the only way I could keep her away from me is I, I found some dishes, and I threw, turned around and started throwing them at her like, like frisbees or something like that. I didn't hit her, but I did damage uh, some of our china. And that's how you create a therapist, just saying. I'll tell you the, the full extent of my fighting career. In sixth grade, I was on the playground, 
and Gary Rudiger came up to me and took a swing at me for no reason. Like, Aww. to this day, I have no idea. I ducked the swing, I grabbed his arm, I turned it behind his back and threw him on the ground and he ran off. <laughs> that was the first thing. The other thing, I, I don't think I've ever told this story publicly, but my brother was friends with this kid in our neighborhood who was just kind of a, a jerk of a kid. And I was upstairs in our house and for whatever reason, again, no provocation, he karate chopped me in the back of my neck. And you know when you get hit like that, and it's like an electrical like yeah. impulse just all down your body. And then he ran and jumped down the stairs, and I caught him squarely, like I, I booted him right on the butt, and he flew up and he hit the little overhang of the stairs, and he cut his head and he lands on his butt, and he's just gushing blood. And I'm like, oh no, so his blood's gushing, and he's holding his butt. And he's, so I grab a, ta a towel, I press it to his head, and I walk him down to his mom, and I'm like, she's gonna kill me, because he's like, it's just, you know how when your head gets cut, it's just a gusher, a you know, mess. it's like blood everywhere. Yeah. Looks like Carrie, the movie. And, and I walked him down there, and I told his mom, he hit me in the back, and I kicked him, and it, this is what happened. She goes, he deserved it. <laughs> so that was the extent of my fighting career. All right, so we all have, to some degree, some history of violence. A little bit. Yeah, more or less. So I want to ask you guys big open question to start with, and we're going to get into specifics here uh, today. And, and we're fine, by the way, if you guys have different points of view or want to push back on that. That would actually make for an even better panel. So we want to invite any perspectives on this. But what do we know from the research about the effects of violent media, like video games, movies, TV, particularly the effects on children, teenagers, and maybe even young adults. What do we know about that? Well, I'm not going to monopolize, but um, what we know is, I'll put it this way, um, video game, it, it, it makes me insane. How many people in here play Fortnite? Oh, wow, okay, okay. but it's just us, okay. <laughs> um, it, for me, it, it's like, don't show a kid Star Wars because they may learn how to shoot a, a, a blaster and wield a lightsaber. Like, no, it's, it's entertainment. And the idea that video games promote violence in kids is uh, a dogmatic and, and not proven by the research. And you can, you can go through decades of where popular culture will pick a thing and say, well, this is creating a problem. There was hearings in the in uh, the US Senate back in the 30s I think where they were trying to ban Superman to ban the sale of Superman or any comics or any comics right. because in psychiatrists testified that if kids read Superman they will have delusions of grandeur and they will start jumping off buildings because they think they can fly it's ridiculous yeah I think about um social learning theory where essentially um, there's a classic study, Bandura and the Bobo doll. Is anyone familiar with that in here? Probably that sounds not. sounds like a great indie band. Right? It does, actually. <laughs> That's a good thought. Um, well, but anyway, so they had um, adults show various kinds of aggression towards this doll, for those of you who don't know, and essentially the children showed similar aggression as well. And so it's this idea that we learn through modeling and through watching and imitation. And so, you know, it kind of has... Every Everyone's up in arms about, okay, well, how is the media influencing our kids, our teens? And I think a lot of it is highly politically charged with the active shooter stuff that we're experiencing a lot now. Um, but I think, and we're going to kind of get into this, like the research, um, it really isn't there in terms of saying that video games especially are actually causing individuals to do these heinous acts. It's just, it doesn't support it. 80% of active shooters never showed any interest in video games. And the games that kids showed the most sort of risky or uh, challenging behavior after playing are things like NBA 2K, uh, driving games, FIFA soccer, because, okay, they've done that. They've been in a car, they've played a sport. They have not been to space and fire, uh, shot aliens on planet Halo. Speak I mean, for this, yourself, Franklin. Well, if, then we need yeah. to talk, because I want to go. But uh, what the research shows is that uh, sort of a heightened uh, nervous system response occurs for about 30 minutes after you play a video game. And it's because you've been sitting there and you've been getting excited and you, all you're moving are your thumbs and fingers. Okay, okay, 
But the, the original research that was done on this was uh, a supposed violent video game, which wasn't violent. And if you win, you get to press a button that blows a puff of air into your opponent's face. Right. And that's a measure of Aggression. violence. Mm -hmm. I'm like, if I have a chance to push, <laughs> I will beat you. OK. <laughs> exactly. I'm going to push that button as much as I can, because that's hilarious. But th it's, it's such a scapegoat, and, and the passion that people have of needing to scapegoat. I, I, I was on a panel uh, months ago about violence in the media and video game culture specifically. And uh, I got a, there was somebody on the panel who was just vehemently against video games of all types. And I was like, wow, this, this person's really intense. And I got a letter, an anonymous handwritten letter, about a week later to my office manager. And it was a very long letter ripping me a new one and how I should be fired, which is hilarious, because I was citing old research, I didn't know what I was talking about, and I did research on this person, and it turns out her son did become addicted to video games, and it kind of messed up his life. But this person's using a, a, a subject of one to extrapolate to everything, and you can't, you can't do that. And, and just to kind of piggyback on that for a moment, I mean, there are kids who, um, Frank was speaking to that arousal, that physiological arousal that you experience when you're playing games, and it becomes heightened, but then for most kids, they're gonna be able to settle down a little bit afterwards. There is going to be the rare child where it is harder for them to simmer down. And it could have been, you know, that person, her, her son, was that kid, um, but it's, for the majority of individuals, it, it's just you chill out after you've yeah, had some time uh, away. We want to make it clear. Frank deserves to be fired. <laughs> right. So th there's no ambiguity there. But yes. for, for that, that's like a negative one on a scale of one to ten for Frank offenses. Yeah. The, one of the things that I'm fascinated by isn't so much the, the nature of violence. Because we know that we, we live in a world with danger and threats. But it's how the media shapes our perception and understanding of violence. And so there is a, a, there's something that's called the availability heuristic, and it's this concept that how quickly you can access or recall an event from happening, that it, it, it shapes your belief of how likely it's gonna happen to you. And so with the advent of social media and 24-hour news cycles, we just get bombarded with all of these negative uh, and scary stories or headlines, because the old catchphrase of media is if it bleeds, it leads, because positive or inspirational stories don't resonate emotionally as much as fear, threat, and danger. And so if we just constantly hear this about kids ruin their lives because of technology or school shootings or suicide, we start to be very vulnerable of personalizing, say that's, that's going to happen to us. It's a bigger danger than maybe the concrete research and data actually suggests. Yeah, if you look at concrete research and data, pregnancy is the lowest it's been, uh, teen pregnancy. Drug use is the lowest it's been. Violence among teens is the lowest on record. But you're not hearing those stories. And it, it's primarily because of the way the human brain is wired. We are designed to look for danger. That's why we're afraid of snakes. Mm -hmm. That's been kind of naturally selected for. If you're not afraid of stuff, some lion's going to come eat you. But we live in a society where we're not necessarily being attacked by lions. Um, and, and so we're looking for the danger. And if somebody says, oh, video game's bad, social media, well, that's another point I'll make in a minute. But then you just latch on to that because you have to have a reason. I will tell you, I'm more afraid of social media than I am violence. And I attribute, in part, this increase in depression or 35% increase in suicide. Um, uh, recently, that we have this FOMO and, and this, this social media phenomenon is overwhelming our brains. I'm far more worried about that than video games. Yeah, FOMO is fear of missing out, for those who don't know. And so, Frank, why do you spend so much time on social media? Because it's for my business. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Just and I have sure. a lot of FOMO. Just making And I'm sure. on antidepressant medication, too, so <laughs> there's that. Part of the reason we're talking about this, obviously, is because there have been some very, very major school shootings and mass shootings in the last year. And there's actually, there have been an uptick 
uh, in the last year or so, year and a half, in mass shootings. What you might not know is that there actually has been, for the past 30 or so years, at least one school shooting a year. So this is not a new phenomenon, but it is, at least in the last year or so, the, the, the number of mass shootings where four or more people are, are injured or killed, or killed um, has increased. But here's why we're talking about this in particular. When this, with Parkland and then with Santa Fe, with those high schools, the conversation began to get steered toward violent video games and movies and television shows, and that became kind of the focus, at least for a while. And it's really important that we understand what's true here, because if you target the wrong thing, you're going to miss big things. So I'm going to tell you a real quick story that makes this point. And this is a, a super important story because it's in our recent history. Back in 2004, the FDA made a decision to put a black box warning on antidepressants for children and teens. It was based on a major study that had about 4,000 kids in it. 2,000 were taking an antidepressant, 2,000 were taking nothing, or a placebo. And based on the results of that, they decided that the risk for teens in terms of suicidal thoughts and attempts was higher, so they put a black box warning on it. Now, let me tell you a couple things. First, it was highly emotional. There were a lot of uh, parents in these uh, testifying about their own child that had been depressed, took an antidepressant, committed suicide, very tragic stuff. But here's what the, what the, the study actually found. For the 2,000 people, that were taking an antidepressant, their risk of having suicidal thoughts was 4%. For people that were on the placebo, their risk was 2%. So the conclusion was it's double the risk. Here's what we know. When someone is actually depressed, very depressed, there's a period of time when they're lifting out of it where they're actually their risk for suicide is a little higher because when they're super depressed, they can't organize their thoughts, they don't have the energy. Now all of a sudden they're still depressed, but now they've got a little bit more bandwidth and wherewithal. That lasts for about a week, week and a half, nine days or so. So in that period of time, you had these people who were depressed, taking antidepressants, their, 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 their suicidal thoughts went up. What's interesting, not one kid in the study, to my knowledge, made an attempt or killed themselves. Mm -hmm. So they put the black box warning on, and here's what happened. There was a 30% decrease in prescriptions for antidepressants for kids in the year or two after that, and a 22% increase in suicide attempts among kids and teens. Mm -hmm. And now what we've seen is that, that when people have become more comfortable uh, with prescribing those medicines, in, in sectors where that's true, the, the, and by the way, we're not psychiatrists, we don't prescribe medicine, we're psychologists, um, but where, where kids get good treatment, including medicine, therapy, their risk for suicide decreases. But when you take one of those kinds of, uh, of treatments away, the suicide rate increases. The reason I'm talking about all that stuff is to say, when you target the wrong thing, a lot of times the risk is high. So if we're talking about what is the risk of violent media, playing a violent video game, watching violent television on kids and teens. If we're targeting the wrong thing, then we're going to miss the bigger stuff. So that's super important. And we're going to hit you again with some even more specific facts. But that, uh, that's where we are with this, is say we, we want to bring good information so that we can make good decisions about it. We're, we're therapists. We should have a black label on our forehead. Because you, you should. Uh, well, yeah, yes. you got a big forehead. Yeah. It could Here, fit there. There, right? okay. there. Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> um, the first session you go to a therapist, suicidal thoughts increase. And why? Well, because now you're dealing with your stuff, and it, it, it's just so frustrating to hear people targeting the wrong stuff. And and also the other problem with this is how social media promotes these theories. I had, uh, I, I know someone who posted on their Facebook page a picture of an AK on this side and school shooting, and on this side, a little kid playing uh, Call of Duty. And it made me insane. And I- That's I, what made him insane. Well, right. yeah. And I had to comment. I, I said, you know, we sell more violent video games 
than any time in history right now, and violence among teens is the lowest at any point in history. And I got blocked for posting a fact. I mean, it, 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 it's just that people want got, to believe what they want it, to believe. You got yes. blocked for so and, many reasons. Yeah, right. and yeah. surround themselves only with what they want to believe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's the same issue with autism and vaccinations. And I know that can be a really hot topic, but Andrew Wakefield was the original researcher who fabricated data to support the linkage between those two things. And it's just, it's a fact that it is not a direct cause, so. Yeah, and I... I feel like we are in a period in our, our culture where anxiety is at an all-time high. And, and actually there's research that says anxiety rates are surging. Yes. We talk a lot about how resiliency in our, in our nation is, is decreasing. But one of the challenges that I see in therapy is when anxiety is high, there is this overcompensation of trying to control things. And it becomes a very all or nothing kind of model or framework for living, we see that even when it comes to the difference between violence or aggression. And I see a lot of zero tolerance that our culture is sort of wrapping itself around in terms of aggression. Physical interaction or play is a very appropriate and normal developmental stage of becoming an adult and ha demonstrating self-control and impulse control and understanding your emotions. But I've had kids in school where they showed a fist just beside them because they were frustrated and they were sent to me. They would have to get a risk assessment because they were afraid that this kid would do something violent to teachers or the school community. And that's what we're seeing in our culture. And I think there's a difference between, between uh, being um, informed and responsive and overreacting with a zero tolerance, everything is, is equally a threat. And there's, this is not a politically correct statement, but there's this whole idea of the demasculinization of, of men in society. And I feel like we're seeing that. You've got 25, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but currently in the US, 50% of 25 year old men are living with their parents, 50%. And it's, it's, there's roles for these behaviors and roles for these sort of psychological principles to be played out, but it's not, it's not because of violent movies or violent video games. It's, it's just not. Well, and there is, a, there is a difference, and I want to make this distinction between overuse mm -hmm. yes. of gaming yes. or overuse of media and violence. And sometimes those things weirdly get merged together. There are issues when someone's playing video games six and eight and more than eight hours a day and it becomes uh, compulsive, addictive, it's sort of all they do, that, that is not a healthy thing. So we're not saying that it's okay to consume any of these media just in this mindless way. The point that I think we're going to try to land on is that the research does not support that looking at violent movies, playing violent video games, and so on, makes someone more violent. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not where it goes. You guys, if you want to uh, tweet us at uh, a question or a comment, it's, the hashtag will be hashtag shrink tank, and we'll get to those also in person if you want to ask a question. We'll have a microphone here. I just want to hit you as you're thinking about that with five facts. These are five facts that are all based on the research. And if you want to see the references for them, if you go to shrinktank.com and, and search for this article about uh, the effects of violence on, in, in media on kids and teens, then you can see the references too. But fact number one is, Frank alluded to this, teen violence has actually been steadily dropping since the mid-90s. It surged around 1992, 394. So if we were having this panel in 1994 and people said, you know, kids are more violent than they've ever been, the answer would be yes. But then since that point, it has steadily declined. It's dropped off in significant ways. And so right now, teen violence is very low, back to like 1960s or pre-rates of teen violence. And at the same time, if you graphed it out, the rates of video game, particularly violent video game sales, have gone up. And so there's actually an inverse relationship between the availability and the use of violent video games and 
and violence. Same for films, too. The other thing that is a fact that, uh, that I want you guys to be good consumers of the, re the research on this is in the research, there's a difference between aggression and violence. And that's an important distinction. Because what the research says is that if a kid watches a violent movie, and by the way, like Frank said, the violent video games and movies that they use in these studies aren't even that violent. They're, they're really not. But if they do, that afterwards, for about an hour or so, half hour to an hour, they're going to play in a more aggressive way. When you watch, they, they put them in a room, you watch some violent movie or play a violent video game, and then you send them out to the playground, compared to the control group who watch just a nature movie or something like that, the kids that watch the violent movie are going to tackle each other more, push, jump around, that kind of stuff. And that effect lasts for about an hour. So when people say the research says that violent video games creates more violence in kids, what the research says is that it increases short-term aggression. Violence is where you injure someone and do physical damage, you do tissue damage to someone, or you threaten or use a weapon. That's how violence is determined. And so there's no support for long-term violence. There's just flat out not. Fact number three, there is a, no relationship between violence and video game consumption across countries and cultures. What I mean is, if you look at the markets that have the top 10 markets that sell and use violent video games or films, there is no relationship between the rates of those use and violence across cultures. It's only in the US where we have high rates of gun violence. Um, and so it's, it's unique to the US. It's not specific to the movies or to the TV shows. Frank also said this, school shooters are actually less likely to consume violent video games than the average teenage boy. The research is pretty clear on that. They're less likely rather than more likely to do it. And the fifth thing is that rates of violent crime actually decrease during the weeks of and following a major video game release, including violent video games. So if you look in any metropolitan area and you look at the rates of violent crime, once, let's say, Grand Theft Auto or Gears of War or some major release, in that city, the rates actually decrease in that week and the week to come, which you would expect if it's so activating and stirring that it would actually increase during that week. It's not true. Um, any other thoughts about, about this research or what we want to communicate about this idea? Well, I think it, <clears throat> it's important. What I, what I say to parents when they ask, you know, should I let my kid play this game or watch this movie, it's really child dependent. So there are some 17-year-olds that I don't want playing Call of Duty. There are some 12-year-olds, I'm fine with it. And you have to know the child and know sort of their emotional makeup and what they're about. My, my, my daughter, when she was four or five, we were walking down the street and a rabbit had gotten hit by a car. And I'm like shielding her and she says, I wanna see. I'm like, no, and she said, no, I wanna see. And she went over to it and she's looking at it and she goes, What's the stuff coming out of its eye? I'm like, oh, oh, oh yeah. what's wrong with you? But she's the kid that watched all of the first, all of the Walking Dead uh, by the time she was 12, and I showed her it. I, I refused to take her to go see it. And over Christmas, she begged me to watch it with her. We watched it. After it's over, she turns and looks at me and goes, "Really? That scared you?" <laughs> now my son, when he was 10. The, the Night Witches in Clone Wars, he couldn't watch that. It was not doable. So I've got my R-rated, you know, 12-year-old watching stuff and my G-rated 12-year-old son. It, it, you, you have to know the child. You have to, to know what they can handle, and they can typically tell you what, what's appropriate for them. And I'm not necessarily a, like this blanket endorser of exposure to violent content to kids, but... Part of the value of testing kids, because parents always say when they're ready, when they're ready, they're willing to, to open up these experiences and content for their kids. But that's not how we get ready in life. How we mature and develop is through trial and error and getting to that, that point where you ex your kids experience something and they're not sure how they feel about it. Because a lot of times when parents are the ultimate 
um, surveyor of what your kids are ready, it can feel very controlling. And, it, and we are in a culture where most often I'm communicating to parents, like, you have to check your own anxiety. Because when you're hyper stressed and worried about your kids, and I completely understand as a parent, I mean, those are the most important people in your life, and you feel this immense obligation, responsibility to protect them. Mm -hmm. and, and parents really have difficulty when, when we talk about how do you start stepping back? How do you start letting your kids to make some of these decisions themselves? But it's really difficult to point out those five data points that Dave mentioned to a parent when they're in their own anxiety loop. It's just very difficult to reason with them. And and let, the let me make this point that what Frank and Jonathan are saying is, is a good point. We're not saying let all kids look at all things. We're not saying that it's fine for any kid of any age to look at any movie or play any video game. That's not the point. The point that we're trying to make is the research does not support that violent media promotes violent behavior. So there's a common sense level to this also of is this appropriate for this kid? Is it healthy for this child? That's a, a, a related but separate issue. Yeah, and I was just gonna piggyback off what Jonathan was saying in the sense that I work a lot with anxious clients and I have to constantly talk, especially for some of um, my social anxiety clients where you know they have to do repeated exposures to these social situations and scenarios. Parents oftentimes wanna engage in these safety behaviors. They're like, well, it's really hard for them. We, you know, She can't handle it or he can't handle it. The reality is you can handle it, um, but you do have to kind of work through that somewhat. And so we can't always protect our kids, even if, you know, you are doing a great job monitoring what your child is watching, um, what they're exposed to. They're going to go over to little Tommy or little Susie's house, and you have no idea what their parents are showing them and what they're able to handle. So you have to be able um, to kind of build some of these skills for them. And related to the anxiety piece, I feel like our, our country, for a variety of reasons, is losing common sense and losing the, the ability to have critical thinking skills. Because there are these correlations, but that doesn't mean causation. So if you want to reduce shark attacks, stop selling ice cream. It's a fact. Ice cream sales go up as shark attacks go up. Well, it's not the ice cream sales, it's because people get in the ocean when they're hot, and more people in the ocean, more people get eaten by sharks. And, and this, this correlation, it, not only does it not exist, but people seem to be losing the ability to critically think through these things and tolerate different opinions because of their own fears. Mm -hmm. Even some of the research, again, kind of going back to this idea of aggression versus violence, there's one study that I thought was hilarious where they measured aggression as willingness to put hot sauce on someone else's food. I would so do, I, oh, I, I yeah. would do that yeah, all the I time. That. I, I would love to put like hot sauce all over something. What did you put uh, salt in a okay, banana? Okay, wait, wait, wait. Now, he, I, I, I hate this guy. <laughs> I had a banana. And he hollowed out the banana with a straw and then filled the hollow part with salt. And then, pardon, pardon me, I was proving to uh, Brandon and our sound engineer that I don't have a gag reflex, don't ask why. And I put the whole banana in my mouth and bit down and salt exploded. Now, that's, I consider violence. And he, and to the point, do you play video games? No. There you go. I rest my case. All right. Anybody in the audience have, have a I'm question? I'm glad I that, Dave. That uh, they'd like to ask. We've got one here and then one in the middle here. So um, while you're doing that, if you also have a um, question you want to send us by Twitter, it's hashtag shrink tank. Uh, John, just a quick question. Have there been any research studies that show the effects of video games that are very violent and the effects of empathy and sympathy in children? If so, how would you measure that in a research study? Yeah, the, there, are, there are studies that do look at aspects of empathy. Mm -hmm. And what we find is that there's not really a compromise of empathy uh, from, from playing video games. That's, that's basically what it, and, and there's also some research with Asperger, kids with Asperger's, similarly, um, and, and it's not what we find. Um, again, what we tend to find is kids are more hopped up and they're more aggressive 
in their play for a short period of time, but in terms of it, it changing their kind of way of relating and thinking about other people, not really. And I would say effects of video games on people is studied in a lot of different ways. So kids who have been playing video games throughout childhood have a wider peripheral vision. Their vision's better. Uh, their problem solving skills are better. They have um, uh, team teamwork aspects, especially if you look at Fortnite, which is just a crazy phenomenon. Because the entire world is playing this game. And it's the first game I've ever played where I'm, I'm fine if I get killed because then I get to watch the next guy and I'm starting to root for this person, this man or woman who, who killed me. And, and there's, there's not a lot of trolls. It's, it's, we're all kind of in this together and we're doing this fun thing. It builds social skills uh, for people who are introverted. With gaming and social media, they tend to be more engaged socially. So there's, there are a lot of benefits to gaming that people are not recognizing. Their colleges now are giving uh, uh, scholarships for video game skills. In the back. Hey, so this is Brendan. Um, so you're saying these violent delights do not beget violent ends. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good call. Um, but then uh, the other question I have is about self-inflicted violence and the rise of that. Is there any study that shows a correlation or any sort of relationship between you know, the violent video games and increasing of online bullying, trolling, and things like that with self-inflicted violence so that we can make other people do harm to themselves without necessarily having to do the harm ourselves? There is an increase in the teen suicide rate mm -hmm. uh, recently, and so that is true. There has not been a connection yet between that and violent media. There is some research that points to a connection between increases in depression and anxiety with certain forms of social media, uh, but not so much with the, the gaming and, and film. Jonathan. And one of the things that recently with Anthony Bourdain and Kate Spade highlighted is, is actually suicide rates have increased in every demographic up to age 75. So if we want to step back and say, well, if we only target the rise and increase with teens and young people, again, we might miss the larger um, problem and, and what are the contributing factors. Because if we want to, again, focus in on video games or, or violent movies or television, that doesn't seem to correlate with folks in their 70s having an increase in taking their own life. Yes, and, and I think, again, it does kind of go back to that social media piece where it's social comparison, right? So you're trying to compare yourself to either the haves or the have-nots. And typically, when you are viewing yourself as not having, you're, you've got that FOMO, that fear of missing out. And so then, again, it's more of this depression piece versus video games. I would say, especially with, with teens, where you're saying, I want to be a part of something, I want to be connected, and so I don't know if it was maybe two years ago, there was this hashtag, I support depression or something on Instagram. And what kids were doing was taking a marker and drawing lines on their arm and saying, oh, I support, you know, I'm behind you, I'm for you. But unfortunately, with people who struggle with various issues, that's a trigger. And so when those photos were taken and put on Instagram, people who are more inclined to do self-harm through cutting, that went through the roof. Because now, oh, okay, I, this is, I, I need to cut. I need to do this to be a part of this thing. And that, again, is social media FOMO. And, and I'm a little bit, I, I deviate a little bit from my colleagues in the sense of the research is there that, that social media can have a negative impact on, on mental health, on depression or anxiety. But there's also both research and some, some um, hypotheses that it also can be a force of positive in terms of identifying folks that are struggling so that they can raise awareness. And it, it creates that fundamental question of, is it causing, is there a relationship, or is it helping us identify young people that now have the language and something to really articulate how they might be struggling and how they're feeling? And one other part that you were hitting on is about being online and being exposed to online bullying and trolling and that kind of thing. And what we know so far is that actually most bullying is still happening in person more so than online. And that, that online communities cut both ways. That for some people it's a great source of support and for other people 
it is a great source of feeling demoralized and, and broken down, and for some people, both. Millie, Millie Bobby Brown from uh, Stranger Things just went offline because she's just been trolled and can't take it anymore. Whereas if somebody wants to troll me, like, have at it. That's hilarious. <laughs> Next question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, say my name. Gary Rogers. Um, yes, I... Well, I have a niece that I'm very close to. Um, I be, I've always believed that kids were way more resil resilient than most people give them credit for. But I, I, on the other hand, was a very sensitive kid. I have been traumatized by various forms of media growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, but my niece, she's fine. <laughs> but there are still things I don't like her watching or being exposed to, even though I know she probably already has been exposed to it and is OK. So my question is, um, well, what advice, what strategies do you have for parents and letting go in that regard? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I tell uh, parents of clients or even when I, I speak to groups is I, I never want to take away a parent's right to parent their kids in the way that they deem appropriate. It's really about having a as much accurate information so you feel like you're making an informed decision versus an emotional or reactive decision. So when it comes to what you want your kids to be exposed to or how, what you want to um, direct and guide them for resources, that's completely up to you. Like, we do not have a video game console in our house. Because um, you're an idiot. Be, yeah, because there's enough Asians that play video games, let's just be honest. No, um, but we promote music. We promote the creative arts. We, you know, and so that, does it make video games wrong? No, it's just something that we have chosen not to really embrace, but at the same token, I have two daughters, one's 15, one is 12, and the, one of them has just a little bit more anxiety, and things can really emotionally impact her more than the other, so in terms of what we deem to be appropriate is different for each of them, not just because of their age. The research tells us it's really more about stage parenting rather than age parenting, that, mm -hmm. oh, they're 12, they're 15, they're 17, a 17-year-old, they can handle an R-rated movie, not necessarily. So, now how do you get kids to buy into that? Well, you have to start early. It's, a, it's a, a relationship, it's a trust, it's a line of communication. So one of the challenges is when parents try to pivot and deviate their parenting approach when they're teenagers, like that's really difficult because if anything, teenagers want you to start backing off. Look, they don't want you to actually start to enforce these, these new kind of parenting approaches with them. And I'm gonna give you guys a couple of Twitter questions. We're gonna try and wrap this up for our next panel, but if you guys could be succinct with these answers, they're great questions. First is from at Corey underscore Holton, and the question is, why is the video game to violence myth so pervasive and persistent? It's a scapegoat. I mean, we have lots of really um, major corporate, I mean, video games are a billion dollar business. I mean, they are generating so much money and, um, you know, then this kind of goes in this political route, too, in terms of blaming um, something other than guns. Mm -hmm. um, the NRA is really lobbying and pushing. And so, I mean, there are lots of things that are influencing this kind of myth. There's also, um, I'm, I'm much older now. What? But I used to say, you can tell the digital divide by whether you play Madden on Thanksgiving or watch Madden on Thanksgiving. And when I talk to, I, I'm seeing a, more of a shift as, as, as these 30 somethings are having kids because they grew up with, with gaming, that I used to have parents say, well, I'm not, I'm not gonna play video games, that's stupid, I don't, I don't understand it. Now I'm actually teaching parents how to play Fortnite. And you should sit down and play with your child and get into the world and, and communicate with them about that. So my hope is that it will fade as old white men die, <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> me included. Wow, this just got dark. <laughs> All right, one more question from Twitter and one more question up front, and then we're going to wrap it up. This is from Corinna Green on Twitter. In our history, people have accused music as a, as a reason for violence, Dungeons and Dragons, and even, even further back, it was books to the point where some of the books were banned. I feel that it's human nature to want to blame something that's out of our control and then try to control it. Any thoughts about that? I mean, she's, she's spot on. Mm -hmm. And it's really the, I mean, as a parent, it would be really 
easy just to say, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can only do this. The challenge is active, ongoing parenting, which is really built on being available, being a part of their lives, and, and having a dynamic relationship. One of the reasons why video games are targeted is a lot of families are using that as a babysitter. That it, there is, mm -hmm. we've talked about, there is some, some real problems of overuse of video games, but there's a difference between spending too much time playing video games and that it's going to have an effect of violence on a person's life. Last question up front. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Um, going back to like hey. the parenting thing, I don't know if there's a right answer to this or not, but is there any research on the parents that are raising this awareness? Because growing up, I had to have my mom with me to buy any rated M game. And I know there are some exceptions now with like Fortnite and digital download, but are there any actually research on maybe different parenting styles that bring up this issue or anything like that? I don't know any research, but I know that like everybody says, oh, we, we got to have the sex talk. Well, it's not a sex talk. It's a sex conversation. Video games, violence, social media, it's a conversation. I, I, I've been having these conversations with my kids since they were little. I mean, my, my daughter, um, she's hilarious. Uh, she was six, I think, and she knows I'm on Twitter all the time. And I looked at her iPad, and she had set up a Twitter account at the age of six and had the tooth fairy as her little image. And I looked at her Twitter feed, and it was so sweet because she, somebody had said something negative about Obama, and she said, you shouldn't tell people to shut up. That's not nice. And then some Disney star uh, tweeted, I woke up, my hair was crazy messed up, and I had a picture. And my daughter said, me too. I do that too. And I'm like, that's really sweet. But the conversation was, you can't, you can't do that. You, you're, you're exposing yourself to things that you don't know. We had a conversation just last week about Instagram. So it, it, it's, a, it's a, I would say the parenting style would be warm, communicative, and authoritative rather than you just can't do this. And it's important for parents to be a part of that. So the idea of like a parent needing to go with you to buy a video game, because when we look at what's called uh, um, doing risk factor analysis, you know, what is someone's risk of violence? They don't ask questions about video games, but they ask an awful lot about, do you have a, a warm, nurturing relationship with your family and caregiving? Do you have the ability to respect authority and follow directions? So to completely remove parents and give kids complete autonomy is not the answer, but it doesn't necessarily mean that mom and dad have to automatically say no to everything. So that relationship piece and the environment that they're being raised has a larger implication of their risk for violence than whether or not they play video games. And I wish we had more time to talk about this because we didn't really get into gender issues that come up with violence in media. So specifically, there's a lot of sexual assault that's portrayed in film and television, especially even you know HBO has been heavily criticized for that. Um, but you know, just having conversations with your girls too about you know some of the things that are happening, whether it is um, you know body expectations and um, being aware of your environment and, and, and whatnot, but there's it's a whole other conversation, um, so maybe we'll do a follow-up on it. And you can listen to the Shrink Tank podcast, and we will hopefully continue to talk about this topic, but that's going to do it for this live recording of the Shrink Tank podcast at Heroes Con 2018. If you're here, we'd love for you to take out your phones, open your podcast app, and subscribe to the Shrink Tank podcast. We would love to have you as part of our recurring audience. Also, you can visit shrinktank.com for great articles and videos about all kinds of things in psychology and pop culture, including an article that gives you all the research that we've referred to today. Our producer and theme music composer is this man right here, Sean Beck. Our associate producer and social media maven is that woman over there, Mariel Butler. For Emma Kate Wright, Frank Gaskell, and Jonathan Hederly, I'm Dave Verhagen. Thanks for listening. Thanks for coming to the panel. Keep coming back and tell your friends about us and make it a great con. Thanks a lot.